Entrepreneurship sounds magical, doesn't it? The individual entrepreneur and entrepreneurs collaborating in small self-directed teams like by instant startups, trying to achieve their dreams and their ambitions. But even more fascinating is the question what makes them successful? What determines the success of small entrepreneurial teams like by instance startups? And that's exactly the key question of this video. Well, first, let's look at some success rate revealed by the Harvard study on startups. And actually, I'm sorry to say so, but it reveals some depressing figures. After five to six years, about 60% of these startups are insolvent, which means, and that's a bit of a nasty word, means they're bankrupt. They stop to be an entrepreneur. They weren't successful. But things get a little bit worse by realizing that after two to three years, about 70 to 80 percent of these startups fail to make a profit. They're not profitable. Well, contrary to common sense expectations, it's not financial reasons like funding which cause these uh, disappointing success rates. The Harvard study revealed that actually these entrepreneurs, especially in startups, they lack business skills. They fail to transform their expertise, their business idea into a successful business strategy. We detected two frameworks. Actually, they are two sides of the same coin. They identify and define those business skills demanded to be successful as an entrepreneur, which means, let's translate it, successful means innovative. So it's the effectuation framework and this design thinking, highly popular frameworks. Well, it's quite boring to uh, explain a model. So let's listen to some entrepreneurs which have been successful, especially in the technology sector, and listen what they have to say. What happened that you started to design an electrical GPS directed electrical boat? Yeah, we started talking uh, uh, with municipalities yeah. and uh, with other uh, groups who are uh, very much into transportation and yeah. logistics. And uh, what came up is that, that uh, the, the roads are crowded, yeah. but uh, actually the waterways are still, uh, for, for there's a lot of space there. We started with Steel Sim VR about three years ago. We yeah. had an advertising agency called uh, Bluff Amsterdam, and one of our clients called us and said, you know what, uh, we have a problem in Wales, uh, Tata Steel. Yeah. And uh, they told us that they had issues with uh, incidents with uh, cranes and yeah. uh, they had a big problem with uh, doing all the edu education for the crane in operators. In a steel factory in Wales. In a steel factory yeah. in Wales. So of course we heard that opportunity and thought from, okay, we, we, should, we should act now and uh, go there immediately. Yeah. Um, but they didn't let us come there immediately, but so we... What um, did you detect? So why did you react on, on we having problems with cranes in the steel industry? Well, the first thing that I noticed that from my own background in yeah. aviation technology is uh, that in aviation they train with simulators all the time. Yeah. So I thought, why don't they train with simulators over there? Yeah. And I asked them and they said, well, there is, there is none. There are no simulators in the steel okay. industry. Yeah. So the first thing I thought, like, okay, can we develop a steel uh, simulator uh, for them? And yeah. maybe if we can do that, it would be very interesting for the whole market. So the strategy must be innovative in that sense that um, the, uh, the, 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 first, the person who gives this assignment are surprised somehow. Uh, yes, surprised, yeah. but also motivated. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also it, it solves their problem from their perspective. Yes, it solves the problem from their perspective. And it's not, they, they were not thinking about the boat as a, as a solution to their problem. Yeah. They were thinking uh, better, making better use of, of, of uh, logistic ways, mm. logistic yeah. roads. Yeah. Uh, and then the boat was the solution that we made a fit. It yeah. made a fit to the builder, it yeah. made a fit for the, for the government. Yeah. And so it's more difficult to come up with a solution yeah. because it, it has to make a better fit yeah. for yeah. more 
partners? Uh, innovation, I think, for small companies is extremely important uh, because uh, obviously your competitive field doesn't sit still. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to be on top of the market. They will be, uh, they'll be trying to take your, uh, to eat your cake. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand uh, what's going on and you need to be able to react to that. Okay. And what, and what we see is that uh, so companies who are able to successfully innovate, yeah, they have a better, um, they have a better chance of, uh, of keeping themselves in business. Mm -hmm. It gives okay. you better understand to react to so the market. Actually, so you say you need it, what what's uh, demanded is a very strong external orientation. Well, we know for uh, like tech startups, they have a very strong internal or orientation on their product. Yeah. So, could you say that brings a lot a lot of dangers and uh, definitely. So. Um, so the way I think innovation is done uh, correctly is that you have you start with an idea, yeah, and then uh, the first thing you do is you test it on the market yeah. and uh, before you start building because building is very expensive. Yeah. So uh, if you look at the sort of innovation process, the design theory is a, is a, is a very well known one. You start with identifying: is there really yeah. a problem that this uh, does the customer, does my target audience really have a, a problem which is worth solving? Okay. And if so, then can I make something that actually solves this problem? Okay. And then when when you have that done, you be, yeah, yeah. Then, then you build it yeah. and you test. The fundamental mistake is that startups start believing in their own initial ID. Okay. They fall in love with their ID instead of uh, their customers falling in love with the product or the ID or the business. Uh, so for me what is key for startups is that they have the flexibility of mind yeah. to challenge their own assumptions about what the customer wants. And if you do so, then you are able to uh, continuously adapt to the circumstances and the wishes of the customers. Uh, and you always have to uh, uh, stay aligned with uh, what you think is truly valuable yeah. or what you believe. Um, uh, but normally that has to do with your vision on the market. And uh, that, that doesn't have to change. Yeah. But sometimes you have to adapt your own uh, uh, business model yeah. um, um, uh, as much as you deem necessary necessary, but also uh, uh, to the extent uh, to which it still remains uh, your business ID. And nobody buys technology, so people buy solutions. Okay. So that should be the primary focus if you are very tech savvy. Yeah. Please understand that nobody buys technology, people buy solutions. So think in terms of uh, what you're going to fix or solve for your customers. So, how can you translate the narratives of these entrepreneurs and uh, the investment banker into business skills? Well, that's exactly, this transformation is exactly why we've chosen two frameworks, two entrepreneurial frameworks, effectuation and design thinking, as explained earlier. Because the main reason is, and that's quite fundamental, there's been a real change in the style and the principles in which uh, entrepreneurs design their innovative uh, business skills and implement them. The old school style, the old style was based on the famous SWOT analysis, which is characterized by uh, you choose one strategic goal, emphasizing the number one, only one goal, and this is mainly based on uh, marketing research. Yeah, and criticism is well. An entrepreneur has to compete with ambiguous markets, complex and ambiguous, unpredictable markets. So, which means that uh, actually choosing one goal based on marketing data, analyzing old consumer behaviors, you can't predict an unsecure future. And that's exactly the difference. So, the main difference is old school is selecting one strategic goal and then selecting and financing all the means necessary to achieve this goal. But there's one big disadvantage. What happens if you, whilst implementing your strategic goal, you find out that it's not really a wise thing to have selected this goal because it doesn't work. It's not appealing. It doesn't solve uh, a problem for your customer. So the new school is actually that you develop an entrepreneurial vision which is highly conceptual. It's a bigger, wider concept. And then the next step is which available means 
are available for me as an entrepreneur, my talents, my unique capacities, and also uh, the strength of my network to achieve these goals. And then you start kind of a circular, iterative, circular process in which embedding feedback in the redesign of your business model is crucial. So you start with a concept, then you reflect on your means, which means are, are available, which are all under my control, because ambiguous, complex, unpredictable markets are not under your control. Your talents are your unique capacities and the strength of your network. So you reflect them and these three, three things, unique talents, unique capacities, the strength of your network, you embed them in your business model and you start a kind of a circular process and then searching for relevant feedback under your future customers and especially stakeholders, not for sales reasons, but for redesign reasons. And then after you redesign, you start again collecting feedback. So it's a circular process and not a linear process because linear processes are uh, characterized by rigidity. Yes, the, the thing is, it's not me coming up with the solution. It's okay. already starting from the beginning. Okay. Uh, that's what design thinking is about. Yeah. You yeah. start with a wide perspective, yeah. with a wide, wicked problem, yeah. and you get the partners together in a room yeah. uh, where they all can talk about the, about the solution. Then you come up with, a, with the actual solution that will work. Okay, because so it's from the beginning you need to collaborate with all these yeah. partners. Yeah. It's not. Uh, 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 designing something in, in your garage yeah, and come yeah. out to the world and say, I've got something brilliant. No, yeah. you start the, the design thinking already from yeah. the start with all the partners involved. To me, a successful startup uh, is all about the team uh, in which the different members all bring their own expertise, which are complementary to each other. Um, business skills, creative skills, financial skills, and in the process of launch, post-launch, uh, you do require uh, a, a different skill set. Uh, and that's why you need to have a team. Yeah. For me, uh, to launch, you need creative people who, are, who have the ability to uh, associate, having uh, yeah, a certain, certain amount of knowledge and you see an opportunity and you connect that opportunity to what you know and create something new. So an associative uh, uh, business, creative business skills uh, is what for me uh, makes, makes a launch possible or the pre-launch towards launch yeah. possible. Currently in universities you have more and more uh, um, studies like uh, industrial uh, design, yeah. where people start to think a uh, more strategic way. Okay. And that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, and I why? Think why is that a good thing? Yeah, because this, this is what the world demands. Uh, you need to have skills to, to, uh, to widen up your, your focus <laughs> yeah. and then get, get it back. And that's what this I think yeah. is about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have a wide focus and then start making it more concrete and more concrete yeah. Yeah. and then come up with a solution. But yeah. in this process, all partners are involved and they also follow this process. Yeah. So it's a kind of a co-creation. It's kind of an iterative step-for-step uh, -step process. Yeah. Uh, which demands creativity and all collaboration skills and especially a strong technical focus. Um, have your partners also, were they talented in building these technical products? Uh, I think the partners are, yes. Yeah. The, and, and, and for instance, our partner that, that's actually building the boat yeah. is, is very renowned international partner on building boats. Okay. But what, what they're good at is building boats. Yeah. What they're not especially good at is uh, looking at a wider perspective. Okay. And these last words of Peter de Bruyne emphasize one of the key features of design thinking. One of the most important things as an entrepreneur is you got to develop a holistic, multifaceted, intelligent and rich entrepreneurial vision, defining the wicked problem you're going to solve. And then it should lead to this rich strategic vision, which is your dot on the higher horizon, which is the basis of your multi-scenario, 
which means are available for me as an entrepreneur to execute a reflection which strategic goals can I achieve by executing these means. In the, in the future, we will work in a more circular way. Yeah. So everybody is connected. And so there are different parties on the water and the different parties on the roads. Yeah. If they collaborate, they can always make sure that the package is uh, yeah. delivered in the most sustainable yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, you need all these parties involved. Yeah. Because nowadays you can say, I have one truck company and they do all the work for me. Yeah. And in the future, you make uh, uh, a collaboration, a, co uh, a coalition of, yeah. of, of several partners who yeah. will do the who do the job. Does that mean that successful entrepreneurship in the future demands skills and qualities, entrepreneurial qualities, to bring all these partners together? Yes, they need a helicopter view. Yeah. So they need to know uh, who's in the business, yeah. and it's not just uh, doing business with one partner, but the whole coalition of partners who, who actually can, this coalition can change by the day. Okay. So you need to more be more adaptive. We use the three lens approach. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, around uh, desirability, yeah. uh, viability and feasibility. Okay. So desirability is just the customer really want it. Yeah. So you, the skills that you need there is you, you have UX designers, yeah. you have uh, people who can do um, um, uh, well, digital marketing, yeah. um, uh, that type of profile. Yeah. And the viability, can we actually make money on this? Yeah. So the, the so these the competencies you need here are people who can make a business model, yeah. um, who can who can think of an idea and really yeah. and really calculate yeah. the economic Profit. value out yeah. of it. Yeah. And yeah. the third part, the feasibility, can we actually build it? Yeah. So here you'd have your in a digital product, which uh, which is typically what we're developing. Yeah. Uh, you'd have uh, your your front end, back end developers. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is important that you, uh, yeah, even as a startup, you have a sort of agile ma a mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a saying that uh, the 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 no proposition survives the first test with real customers. Okay. And so you need to be able to understand and you need to be able to adapt your, your, your value proposition. It's kind of a redesign process yeah. is very, very important. Exactly, yeah. yes. And, and so, what, so what's typically the most expensive thing that you do is when you start building, uh, and if it's a digital product, you start developing. Yeah. Uh, so you try, so you have to be absolutely sure that what yeah. you're building, yeah. then, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's going to fly. Yeah. Well, in the beginning, the, the first, because it was a project and the customer, Tata Steel, had the most requirements. Yeah. But after we created a project of it, uh, which is called Steel Sim VR, yeah. and we wanted to, to let, the, let the world know that we got that, yeah. and that was a different game, of course, because then we need to find, okay, what, 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 what kind of functionality does our product need, need yeah. to have? And there are a lot of functionalities in yeah. technology which, which are crazy uh, cool to have, you know, yeah. seeing your hands, uh, eye tracking, uh, stretch measure measurements on, yeah. on your wrist and stuff like that. But we didn't know if the clients are, are actually wanted that product. Yeah. So what we did now uh, with a new customer of ours, yeah. uh, our seller Meta, which is um, the biggest steel company in the world, we said, okay, this is our product, this is what it costs, we yeah. want to implement your content within it, yeah. but help us, uh, let, let's, let's improve our product together with new functionality functionalities that are yeah. actually matter. So you got to empathize with your client. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then when, when you create it together, I mean, yeah. I think the old fashioned way is still, uh, you send your quote out and then you meet your client again nine months later and say, hey, yeah. this is your product. And then your client's going to use it. I'm thinking like, well, that's yeah. a bit useless. No, and innovative entrepreneurship in the technology yeah. is a co-creation process. Definitely. It, it yeah. and and that's quite client. hard to yeah. actually co-create that within a company because yeah. They're not used to it. They already want to know in the beginning and, and even in the contract, like what is this simulator going to do exactly? Okay. What, is it, what is it going to do and what is it not going to do? Yeah. And a lot of the time we both have to say like, yeah, we don't, we don't know yet. We need yeah. to find out along the way how it's going to work. Yeah. We know yeah. what the end goal is. Yeah. The people need to train faster and safer yeah. uh, and, and on a digital twin of their crane. But yeah. how it's going to look exactly, yeah. how we're going to do stuff, well, we yeah. don't know yet. We need yeah. to find out. Yeah.
your experience at uh, quite some technology startups, they they keep introverted in their building? Is that, is that a kind of a mistake you often make? Yeah, I, I often say they're a little autistic. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, but yeah. no. Uh, uh, yes, and they actually are, because they have really f good focus on their, on their product. And yeah. that's good, because you have to have product focus. But on the other hand, this product will be part of a, yeah. of a wide uh, solution that yeah. will involve a lot of partners. Yeah. So. I think that's changing in, in this world, yeah. where in, in the past technical people could have focus on, on building a, a bike or, or a car and then come out to the world and say I have something brilliant. Today uh, you have to involve uh, in building this boat, yeah. you do this together uh, with other partners who yeah. are not especially boat builders. So you actually bring uh, partners together, yeah. have this synergy in opportunity recognition, Yes. but then immediately go into the outside world? Yes, and maybe before you start building your boat, or actually before you start inventing yeah. uh, the solution, start talking to, to, uh, to the community. Yeah. And, and that takes a different kind of approach. And that's what design thinking is about, yeah. and yeah. that's what effectuation is about. Yeah. I think what kind of competence do you need in your team yeah. To get this whole team together yeah. uh, and, and all these partners together and yeah. still make them understand what, what it's yeah. about. Well, let's accentuate a piece of information we just heard from Peter de Bruyne. The crazy quilt principle is not only about inspiring networking, using your social network as a source of inspiration to redesign your business model. Now it's also about seeking and forming strategic alliances with strategic partners. The old business thinking, like based on the SWOT analysis, it means compete with your competitors by pushing them out of the market. Well, that's one of the most intelligent things emphasized by the effectuation framework. No, don't compete, but form and seek strategic alliances with interesting partners. So you can form this or create this synergy between different sources of human capital. The Lemonade Principle. Well, scientific research on the Lemonade Principle has shown that it's an important issue on the road to success. It implicates that effectively coping with frustration, setbacks and implementation problems, that learning from these setbacks and frustrations and problems, effectively learning and transferring them into something re innovative, redesigning your uh, business model by using information concerning these setbacks, that these entrepreneurs with these capacities, these innovative capacities, are far more successful than uh, entrepreneurs lacking these abilities. So this is an important lesson to be learned. It's called the contingency leverage principle, using lessons learned from frustrations and setbacks as a leverage to improve your business model. Because the small companies, entrepreneurial companies like startups, they have a huge advantage as opposed to the bigger companies. Why? Because the bigger companies are layered into multiple layers and the whole operational process is structured into different particles like logistics, uh, marketing, sales. And this labor differentiation, that's what it's called, different, differentiating different pieces of the operational process. This hampers the capacity to be innovative and learn in a flexible way from frustrations. You should always be innovative, yeah. that's for sure. But as a small company, you are more flexible in being innovative. Yeah. Yeah, so the innovation can be, let's say, in the furniture itself. So yeah. you're working with like new ways of uh, movement in relaxed chairs, uh, mm -hmm. for instance. Uh, but there's also a lot of innovation in how you present it. Okay. Um, uh, of course, having free 3D printing is nice. Yeah. But now we are working with virtual reality. Okay. Uh, so if we present our collection to a customer, yeah. 
they basically put on the glasses and yeah. they're in this new design world and yeah. they can you can almost touch the furniture real so, so, it's so is that something in your world which is really innovative 3d presentations um, yeah, like how we are doing it in the furniture industry is totally new. Yeah. But of course, it's not new because it's it's done in the car car design right. uh, yeah, industry yeah. because yeah. then you can uh, already really see the shapes. It's it's just different when you when you're looking through that system yeah. uh, compared to how you look it on a monitor. Yeah. Yeah. In the monitor, you always I always say you look it's like you're looking at fishes in the aquarium. You know, you're not really. <laughs> yeah. I have an understanding of yeah. what the full size is yeah. and it's what the really proportion is it? and the details so yeah. you miss a lot of them yeah. well when you start prototyping something very interesting starts because you get some really uh, realistic insights into your risks um, the affordable loss principle means that you should conduct a very well scrutinized, meaning well analyzed risk analysis as an entrepreneur. And I should emphasize something because a risk analysis is not really popular with, a, with, a, with the mainstream business coach. Why? Because for them it's synonymous for risk aversion and they hate entrepreneurs who are risk aversive. They say the key to entrepreneurship is risk taking. Well, to emphasize this, I'm sorry to say, I don't want to boast myself, I did some very comprehensive research on this issue and small independent entrepreneurs who conducted or have capacities in conducting a well scrutinized risk analysis were far more effective and far more successful than those entrepreneurs lacking these capacities or abilities. It means to actually design a worst case scenario. That's what the affordable loss principle describes as an effective strategic decision-making skill. And after you have conducted such a risk analysis by um, designing a worst case scenario, select those risks with high costs. And then especially think about, are they affordable to me? Lean and mean startup means conducting, prototyping, being very cost efficient, cost effective, and that's the essence. And that's why you should combine prototyping with the affordable loss principle. In your experience, you know this technical world pretty well. What are, what are the common mistakes uh, startups make? Uh, I think the, that uh, staying too long in the prototyping phase. Huh? Okay. If, because you have a lot of partners who are actually living in the real world yeah. uh, and not in a an, in lab situation, yeah. uh, the first thing you need to do is build a shitty prototype yeah. uh, and, and start using it and start uh, showing it to people and yeah. say, okay, how can we make it better?